Welcome, brothers and sisters. I am Adam's humble servant, commanded to bring you this new kind of message. Raiders are as integral to the wasteland as straps are to a super mutant's face. So I set out on a video series that I hope to continue into all the Fallout games. And in this first attempt with Fallout 4, I will be covering the lore of all the named Raider gangs. I have gone through all the locations on the Fallout 4 map and determined what kind of groups live in or occupies these locations. I focused on marked locations, but included a handful of unmarked ones as well, and approximated the distribution of whatever calls that place home. Super mutants, raiders, settlers, creatures, and a lot more are shown with distinct patterns, and when just looking at it, there is quite a bit to take in. My aim is to use this map as an aid to help me in explaining lore and even allow for some fun speculation. As I stated before, raiders take front stage and have been divided based on whether they have a named raider boss or not. Raiders without a named boss are considered a generic band of raiders and often have very little lore about them. Their location is represented by solid green and these markers represent the area of influence. So if you were in game, in the area within these markers, you would likely be spotted and attacked by whatever is living there. Each raider group that has a boss has their own color and pattern combo to differentiate them on the map. And in addition to their location marker, I have speculated on likely areas of influence based on lore and in-game observations. And this is where things start to get subjective. Raider groups also have interactions with other groups, and I have marked these relationships with lines. The colors have different meanings, and I will get into that later. Lastly, I have markers for other groups. Settlements are solid white. Creatures and environmental threats are yellow dots. Red dots are super mutants. Blue dots are gunners. Black dots represent randomly assigned enemy types. Green dots are children of Adam, of course. And checkered patterns are main factions. Okay, that was a lot. And I just need to shut up and get to the good stuff already because this is going to be a beast of a video. And because of that, I will be postponing my comment highlight for my next long form video. If you think this is an interesting format, let me know, because I hope to look at other groups and creatures with the help of a map to tease out details and offer speculation. So turn up the rads and listen to Rad Dad as I drone on for way too long about the raider gangs of Fallout 4. Let's start off strong with the biggest raider group in the Commonwealth, and for the purposes of this video, the Gunners are not considered a raider group, rather a mercenary faction with raider-like tendencies, so we will have to save the Gunners for another video. DLC raiders are also not considered for this video, but may be considered for a future one. So, pop quiz, do you know who the biggest raider group is in the Commonwealth? Why, it's Bosco, and if that name doesn't ring a bell, well, his outfit probably will, because he's the Commonwealth's killer furry. Bosco is the raider boss that is based in the DB Technical School, located in downtown Boston and runs the biggest raider group in the Commonwealth. Bosco commands the most men of any other raider group, with around 45 raiders that are confirmed to be under his command. This number is only an approximate number based on the number of raiders I encountered in the locations he directly controls, which can fluctuate depending on the player's level and other variables. I counted around 20 at the DB Technical School, which is his base, another 5 in the metro station that connects to the school, 10 in the Shamrock Tap House, and another 10 in Backstreet Apparel. Bosco has more confirmed locations than any other raider group as well. His ambitious expansion plans of controlling downtown Boston have been paying off. He subdued the raiders in the Shamrock Tap House, east of the school by having all of his raiders lock all the tap houses doors and letting a bunch of attack dogs inside. All those that weren't torn to shreds by the dogs surrendered, becoming a part of Bosco's crew. Likewise, Bosco attacked the raiders at Backstreet Apparel, north and west of the school, taking that area as well. So this is where some of the fun comes in looking at the map because does the biggest, baddest raider boss in the whole commonwealth really just control four isolated locations? I would contend that some of the generic, unnamed groups of raiders around Bosco's bases 
are also under his control. And I will tell you why, because this sets a precedent that will be applied throughout the rest of this video. Take a look at the map. Between the technical school where Bosco is based and the Shamrock Tap House to the east and the Backstreet Apparel to the north, there are a lot of other groups. Super mutants, gunners, hostile creatures like ghouls or swan, and lastly, other generic raiders. How would Bosco effectively communicate? Transport men and supplies to and from, and you know, just be an effective raider boss if all these locations are separated by hostile groups. Some of you may be thinking, well, you just travel to and from by sneaking around and not getting noticed. And I know that because I'm psychic. So I tested this out. Starting at the school, I tried to get to Backstreet Apparel and Shamrock Tap House without being spotted. That is the ghost run, if you will let me use a dishonor term, and the best case scenario. Otherwise, if I did get spotted, I tried to just get away to safety, since just trying to get away from some murderous raiders would be the second best option. It didn't matter which way I went, I always was spotted by and engaged by hostile groups. There was no way to completely get from the school to the other locations without being spotted and shot at by hostile enemies. However, if we consider the raiders that we encounter close by to be part of Bosco's area of influence, that changes things. I was able to get by the gunners, the creatures, and the super mutants with the occasional pop-up ghoul, but hey, it's Boston. What's a stroll through the city without getting your leg chewed off by a feral ghoul? This could be evidence that Bosco's area of influence is much bigger than just the immediate areas around his bases, since fighting tooth and nail to get from one area to another just isn't feasible, and those locations would likely break away and do their own thing. So, is that convincing? I hope so. It makes sense to me, but if you aren't convinced, how about this? A terminal owned by Bosco at the technical school holds some journal entries, with one part that is especially pertinent to my argument. In the entry titled Shamrock, he talks about how they took Shamrock Tap House and then says this, now all that's left is Backstreet Apparel, then downtown is ours. Huh? Downtown is yours if you hold four locations in the entirety of downtown Boston? That doesn't make sense. Unless at least some of these raider groups that have no obvious affiliation with Bosco do in fact report to him. That is direct evidence that raiders with no in-game connection to large raider gangs may be subject to, or at least allied with, these larger gangs. So, with this precedent set, let's take a look at some of the possibilities for the area that Bosco controls. The map as it stands now is the most conservative scenario, and I think I've proven that the terminal entry and my boots on the ground approach don't represent Bosco's actual area of control. This is the first of the realistic scenarios. Raider groups that are between Bosco's holdings are considered to be under his control, but no more than that. Downtown has large areas that are controlled by super mutants, gunners, and the plaza that Swan is found at, which is left empty due to how dangerous he is. This is the second realistic scenario, although I do think it's slightly less likely, mainly because when going south from the school, you have to drop off a wall onto the highway below, and there are limited paths in and out of the recessed highway. Lastly, this is what I would consider the most liberal scenario, where any raider groups that are within a short distance of each other could be considered under Bosco's control. However, this scenario has the most assumptions, mainly that if two raider groups are relatively close, that they are probably under the same leader. But that just isn't substantiated anywhere in game, and following Occam's razor, I think the prior scenarios are more probable, since the only assumption is that the raider groups between bases are under Bosco's control. I would be interested to see what you guys think is more probable, and if there is something I haven't considered that might affect these scenarios. One underappreciated aspect of these named raider groups in Fallout 4 is that many of the big ones will have a certain level of interactivity, as they like to keep tabs on some of the other raider leaders. If the sole survivor wipes out the raiders in one location, and kills the leader, terminal entries can be found at some other raider locations that celebrate the death of a rival. So I mapped out these relationships with white arrows. Bosco is most concerned with Tower Tom at the Beantown Brewery, Wire or Gabrielle at Libertalia, and Scudder at Hyde Park. Only Tower Tom reciprocates this behavior, 
the terminal at Libertalia does not speak of any other raider boss, and Scudder at Hyde Park does not have a terminal that he records his thoughts in. I think this is interesting, and have a few thoughts and questions. Since Bosco is so interested in holding downtown, I would think that the Triggermen, who are holed up in the Park Street Station and the unfinished Vault 114, would be the most direct threat. They are a large group, they are organized, and they are right smack dab in the area he wishes to control. Being interested in Scudder at Hyde Park might make some sense since that is the closest large group of raiders to the south, but Tower Tom in the northwest seems a bit too far to be all that concerned with. What is really puzzling, however, is that Bosco is more interested in Libertalia than he is Judge Zeller at Eastern Boston Preparatory School. Zeller is a lot closer. He also commands a large group of raiders and has been aggressive in recruiting and extracting money from Bunker Hill. Bosco's terminal entries on Tower Tom and Scudder also seem to imply he had a personal beef with them, so the interest for them might be purely personal. We don't have information on what settlements Bosco raids directly, and unlike some of the other big groups, he does not demand dues from Bunker Hill to allow their trade caravans safe passage. This could mean that these traders completely avoid downtown, which would definitely make sense, but I would also think Bunker Hill would trade with Diamond City or Good Neighbor, which would put caravans in striking distance. We can get an idea of some of the things that Bosco's group gets up to based on the quests that are associated with the technical school. The quests that stick out are kidnapping, reclamation, and to the mattresses. Now these are all radiant quests and have the possibility of taking the player to a number of places, but not every raider location has the same quests. So we may be able to deduce some of the raider group's behavior based on which quests are associated with them. Kidnapping involves rescuing hostages from a raider group. And again, since this is a radiant quest, we can't definitively say which settlements are targeted by Bosco specifically, but hostage taking is definitely a practice they engage in. Reclamation reinforces this hostage taking behavior since this is an institute quest to free a synth taken hostage by raiders. To the mattresses is an interesting one because it means that the location can harbor a named raider that is part of the L&L &L gang, which is a raider group with a keen interest in finding and killing synths. So the fact that one such raider has the possibility of showing up at the technical school means there is some level of cooperation between Bosco and the L&L &L gang. The Shamrock Tap House under Gaff, who reports to Bosco, has all the same quests with one additional one, Raider Troubles, which is a quest where a settlement asks for help dealing with a raider group who is attacking and harassing them. Backstreet Apparel Under Clutch has the same as the other two with another one, Diamond City's Most Wanted, where Diamond City will post rewards for the killing of wanted individuals, and it appears Clutch has been too much of a threat and nuisance to Diamond City. So now we get to some speculation based on what we know about Bosco's gang, but we also need to know him a little bit better. Bosco is a tough leader with ambitions to take over downtown and apparently has the chops to pull it off since he has successfully subdued two other locations. Bosco seems to supply his raider groups well since there are many of them and no sign of loyalty issues due to a lack of respect or living standard. This would all seem to indicate that Bosco might go on to become the biggest threat downtown if he can keep up this growth. But there is one fatal flaw. In the attack at Backstreet Apparel, one of his henchmen's dogs bit him and refused to let go. After killing the dog, and it is insinuated the dog keeper, Torque, is killed as well, Bosco begins to feel ill. He blacks out and loses his temper in explosive outbursts. This evolves into full-blown paranoia about being assassinated and being poisoned. And a key detail here, he seems to be constantly thirsty and needing water. His paranoia continues when he sees what he thinks is a beast in the basement, sending his raiders down to kill it. In reality, he was the beast, blacking out and massacring his men, and the beast with the reflecting eye that he sees in the basement, well, it's a partially destroyed high school mascot mask that his raiders eventually recover and bring to him. His recent life events indicate that he has been infected with rabies from the dog bite, hinted mostly by his aggressiveness and constant need for water. 
He does not realize this, and it is likely that no one else does either, so there is virtually no way for Bosco to be cured of this, as untreated rabies is fatal in almost every case. We can surmise then that no matter what Bosco's ambitions are, his raider group will soon lose their leader, and the power vacuum will likely cause the group to fracture. His death will gain a lot of attention, as many other raider leaders are interested in Bosco's death, should it happen in game, including Slag, who leads the Forged, Tower Tom as mentioned before, and Jared at the Corvega assembly plant. So I would surmise the power struggle after his inevitable death would be incredibly violent. From one big raider group to another, Judge Zeller might not have multiple known bases and outposts like Bosco, but do not underestimate this sadist. Zeller is based in the East Boston Preparatory School, and similar to Bosco, commands an impressive force of raiders that can vary between 20 and 30. They are located east, outside of the downtown area, and separated by the large channel. This area is rather remote, with no large settlements nearby, and far fewer threats than in the concrete jungle that Bosco resides in. Farther south is where the Brotherhood has set up shop, and to the east is the Easy City Downs, where robot races are bet on by raiders. That operation is run by Eager Ernie, who is a triggerman, although it is possible that some of Zeller's raiders go there to bet and get drunk. In trying to identify the potential area that Zeller controls, the main hint comes from his relationship with Bunker Hill. Zeller extracts payment from Bunker Hill for leaving the settlement and its caravans alone. But this isn't enough for Zeller, who has started taking caravans hostage. For Zeller to threaten Bunker Hill enough to extort them, and even take hostages, means that he likely controls the area around the Maurice J. Tobin Bridge, and maybe even the Alfred Street Bridge farther west. Controlling access to these bridges would mean any of the northeast settlements that want to do trading with Bunker Hill would be subject to his demands. The closest settlement, County Crossing, does not specifically mention Zeller and his raiders, but given the proximity, they could very easily raid the settlement at a whim. They couldn't control too far south or they would run into problems with the Brotherhood, but it is conceivable they considered the empty and destroyed area just south and west as their territory. Looking east, things get interesting because Easy City Downs, as stated previously, is not far away and is run by Easy Ernie, who is a trigger man. Even more interesting, however, is that Ernie pays dues to Libertalia, and these payments are based on a proportion of his earnings for running races. So, even though Libertalia is farther away, they are so much more of a threat that Ernie pays dues to Libertalia and not Zeller so it is unlikely his influence would extend east very far. So here's what I would consider one realistic scenario, one where Zeller's influence eastward is minimal, there is a buffer between his territory and the Brotherhood, they don't quite exert control over County Crossing since there is no explicit mention, and they control access to the north bridges that lead to Bunker Hill. Another realistic scenario, Zeller controls a bit more of the eastern portion, the County Crossing settlement, and only one bridge to Bunker Hill the closest one. The most charitable distribution would still be hindered south and east by larger groups, but would extend farther west and north, essentially controlling a lot of this empty area. There isn't necessarily a reason for it, but there also isn't much resistance that would keep his raiders from patrolling this area. They just need to stay away from the super mutants and locations with a heavy creature and robotic presence. Again, I think this is the least likely, but it is interesting to consider the upper limits. I think it's worth noting that Zeller is not referenced by any other raider leader, not even Slag at Saugus Ironworks, who he is not far away from. Trailing behind Bosco, Libertalia, and Jared at the Corvega assembly plant, but is very active in recruiting new members, especially while he takes more and more from Bunker Hill and their caravans. Zeller is building a so-called army through what he calls re-education and even tries to lure in unsuspecting people with large signs outside that invite traders to come and trade. Zeller records his re-education efforts on some terminal entries, giving people denigrating nicknames based on the education method. And by that, I mean torture. Once Zeller could break someone, they would sign a blood contract, literally with their own blood, where they swear allegiance to Zeller and are integrated into his army, much like my lovely patrons. Some of the torturers include isolation, burning the soles of the feet, broken fingers, tooth removal, good old face beatings, 
death by rats, and finally, removing eyes or hands. In all recorded instances, this eventually led to the people signing a blood contract, but one person, named Killer, apparently smiled at them while they tried all their torture techniques, even spitting in their faces. When Zeller couldn't break him, he had him killed. The quests associated with the prep school are kidnapping, reclamation, to the mattresses, and prep school. So we have two radiant quests related to kidnapping, and one that ties Zeller to the LNL gang. The unique quest, Prep School, is issued by the leader of Bunker Hill, Kessler, who asks the sole survivor to go to the school and free the caravans that have been taken hostage. With all of these kidnapping quests, and no mention of quests that specifically mention raiding, it would seem Zeller is more interested in taking hostages, ransoms, and extortions, rather than just outright raiding. Speculating on Zeller, he does not seem to be in a very advantageous position. His increasing pressure on Bunker Hill is forcing Kessler to look for solutions, i.e. someone crazy enough to take the fight to Zeller. Libertalia will continue to be a strong force, keeping them contained from the east, and the Brotherhood to the south is likely the most important variable to Zeller's future. If the Brotherhood are not destroyed, I don't see Zeller lasting much longer, as the Brotherhood has a concentrated effort to remove raiders and other threatening groups, as reflected in their cleansing the Commonwealth Radiant quests. If the Brotherhood is destroyed, that might give Zeller a chance, especially if he can expand south and scavenge what's left of the Boston airport. Zeller's fate will likely rest on if the Brotherhood is wiped out or not, and if his recruiting efforts can keep up with the mounting pressure from Bunker Hill. Since we have been talking about it quite a bit, let's take a look at Libertalia. Libertalia is unique in many ways, the most obvious being that it is a settlement built with many floating objects out on the water. It was actually founded by a group that started out as Minutemen, who over time had to resort to raider tactics to survive. In the early game, the leader is one James Wire, who was the leader of the Minutemen who took the settlement and tried to make an honest living by trying to protect and help other settlements. It was simply not feasible, and eventually they slid into full-blown raiding, which Wire regretted greatly and chronicled on his personal terminal. Wire will be the leader of the Libertalia Raiders until the player advances the Institute questline to the quest Synth Retention, which removes Wire as the leader, although why this happens and his ultimate fate is unknown. A mind-wiped synth known as Gabriel will then ascend as Raider Boss and is sought after by the Institute. He can then be confronted and recovered with the help of the sole survivor. Libertalia is a rather large Raider group with about 20 Raiders, one of which is the fan favorite dude that sits up on a perch with a fat man, so they are quite heavily armed. As mentioned before, Easy City Downs is forced to pay Libertalia some sort of protection money, which is a portion of the money that Eager Ernie makes off the robot races. Not only do they extract money from Eager Ernie, they are also paid dues by Bunker Hill. This is particularly interesting because Libertalia is quite a ways away from Bunker Hill and doesn't seem like it would be a direct threat. Well, what if they are paying for leaving trade caravans alone? Sure, that is a possibility, but let's take a look at the map. The small strip of land to the north doesn't have any settlements, so control of that area wouldn't threaten Bunker Hill. In fact, the entire northeast chunk of the Commonwealth has no settlements of any appreciable size. With just some isolated people like Theodore Collins at the Long Neck Lukowski's Cannery, or Barney Rook up at his family's house. So unless there's some big off-map groups sending down caravans, there are likely not many traders headed this way because of the sparse population. So with the exception of one small sandy settlement at Nordhagen, what potential trade routes or settlements could they be threatening? Well, here's a reasonable but generous option. Easy City Downs falls into their territory, but they can't go too far south because they run into a big contingent of super mutants. They would be bumping up against Zeller and his crew, and another slightly smaller crew ran by Cinder. And I extend out their influence enough that could justify their relationship with Bunker Hill. If they aren't threatening settlements or travel routes, then the protection money just doesn't make any sense. Another realistic and yet again generous interpretation shifts their holdings up north a bit more. They still have Nordhagen Beach and Easy City Downs, but now control some of the north bridges that may have some trade significance. The most liberal of all scenarios shows control west and north, 
but again, I always deem this the least likely one. Rather interestingly, the only quest associated with this location is the Institute quest of Synth Retention to recover Gabriel, and nothing else would bring the player to Libertalia except for sheer curiosity. We might be able to interpret this to mean that they are less interested in raiding settlements or taking hostages like Zeller, preferring to just extort groups where possible. Using this information, what can we say about Libertalia? Well, I find the disappearance of James Wire as leader pretty interesting. There is just no information as to why or how. Is he dead? Did he just leave? Given that he was a Minuteman turned raider and was rather disgusted with himself, it is reasonable that Wire left the raider group, severely disappointed by his new raider lifestyle. Additionally, Libertalia is a very difficult place to take over. Bosco, the biggest raider boss in the Commonwealth, has a terminal entry where he briefly considers trying to take Libertalia before deciding it isn't worth it because there's just too much water. Raiders at Libertalia have the best chance of staving off attack, and that would also apply to the Brotherhood since all the floating encampments are a trap for power armor. One small slip, and it's all the way to the bottom. Northwest of Libertalia, we have another major raider faction, and this one is very interesting. The Forged is a raider group led by Slag, the raider boss who rules with supreme authority over his base at Saugus Ironworks. This pre-war processing plant was used to refine steel for the US war effort against China, and under Slag's leadership, the fires have been rekindled. Slag records some of his accomplishments in a terminal, including his first attempts at recruiting new members. Slag is obsessed with strength and fire, and created what he calls the trials to filter out, or refine, because, you know, to filter out those that are weak, so only the strongest will survive. The new recruits were failing the trials, which made Slag consider moving operations outside of the Commonwealth altogether, which is an interesting statement because it almost gives the impression that he comes from outside the Commonwealth. The ironworks are very close to a gunner operational base, and Slag could tell the gunners were cut from a different cloth from the average wastelander. He convinced some gunners to attempt the trials, many of which passed and joined his ranks. This caused an issue with the gunners, which escalated to straight up violence, but Slag and the Forged were powerful enough that the gunners sued for peace, which stands to this day. Slag would continue to grow his ranks now that his reputation was whispered around the wasteland as the raiders that stood up to gunners. What the Forged use all the metal for is unknown, although we may assume that they are making weapons or armor. Needing more sources for raw materials, Slag sent a group of Forged to the nearby Dunwich Borer's Quarry, where they were to harvest scrap metal and transport it back to the ironworks. This endeavor, while initially successful, started to encounter problems as the raiders that were harvesting the scrap metal started to become fearful of the inner quarry area, causing them to miss metal shipments. Slag sent a subordinate named Bedlam to get shipments back on schedule, which worked for a bit, but once again, shipments fell behind. The raiders that are smart stay away from the deep portions of the quarry, and the brave ones encounter an ancient evil that causes them to go insane. Bedlam is one of the latter, taking it upon herself to go back there and sort out what she thought was just a bunch of feral ghouls, but has since lost her grip on reality like many before her. The only other known relationship with outside groups is the Finch Farm, just south of the Ironworks, which is under constant threat of raids and has been attacked by the Forged. This causes one of the family members, Jake Finch, to attempt to join the Forged in a rather naive attempt to convince the Forged to leave his family farm alone. Knowing all this, we can start to look at what areas Slag may control. The Gunners reduce how far east they can expand, but he would obviously control this small road that crosses the river and leads straight to the Dunwich Borer Quarry. There is no evidence that Forged have a presence farther east than the quarry. We know that the Forged attack the Finch Farm and probably don't extend much farther south than that because of the super mutant presence. The Slog is another settlement to the north, and there is no mention of the Forged raiding the Slog anywhere, but it is very common to see the Forged and Slog settlers get into firefights. <laughs> Fire. Because the settlements are just so close to each other, so I think it is reasonable to assume that they have frequent confrontations due to in-game observations. Although there is a lot of area out west, again, we would have to make more assumptions to consider that as part of Slag's area. 
So the most realistic options, in my opinion, are like so. One includes the slog in their territory, and another doesn't. The liberal scenario includes a large portion of the western area because it is empty and would be easy to control, but is pure speculation. The forged have the manpower to cover a large area, with around 20 including slag at Saugus and around 15 at the quarry, making them the third largest raider group by population. But they seem focused on their work at Saugus, although it isn't clear what exactly that is. Slag has several terminal entries about other raider bosses of interest, including Libertalia, Bosco, and Jared, who is at the Corvega assembly plant. In Slag's usual fixation on strength and weakness, he considered Libertalia and Jared as being weak, and therefore is not surprised at their destruction. Bosco, on the other hand, holds some respect in the eyes of Slag as he remarks the Commonwealth must be tougher than he thought since someone took the lunatic out. Knowing this about Slag, it isn't surprising that he doesn't seem to care about any other raider group, since the three he writes about are three of the largest in the Commonwealth. The Ironworks is associated with several quests including kidnapping, stop the raiding, to the mattresses, raider troubles, and out of the fire. The last quest is the unique quest to help the Finch farm in getting Jake and or the family heirloom back. Dunwich Boar's quests are all the same, so the Forged are definitely involved with everything we would expect of a raider group. Good old kidnapping and raiding. As far as the speculation goes, the Forged are unique in that they are given a group name, rather than being referred to as just Slag's crew. This means that should Slag die, there is a better chance that the group can keep cohesion since they have a common identity. The Forged have some of the best chances at becoming the most fierce raiders in the Commonwealth, since they prize quality over quantity, but they also have a large group of raiders. Having subdued the local gunner base shows their capability, but this could also mean that the gunners might target the forged specifically if they feel like they are too much of a threat. A forged gunner war would make for some really interesting gameplay. So since we have talked about them several times, let's turn our attention towards Lexington and the Corvega assembly plant. Jared is another raider with a Minuteman background. He was a young boy with the Minutemen when Mama Murphy, the local crackhead soothsayer, told him that he would grow up to be a monster. That seems kind of harsh to tell a little kid, but she was right. Jared would become a brutal raider that attracted a following. He became obsessed with Mama Murphy's sight, and all he knew about it was that it took chems to work. He was constantly taking chems to try and get this gift, and when that didn't work, he began to lure new raider recruits with the promise of free chems, where he was hoping one of them would manifest the same gift. The Corvega assembly plant was large and could easily become a base, but it and the nearby town of Lexington were awash in feral ghouls. They cleared the plant and made it their base, but as of 2287 when the game takes place, they still have not completely cleared Lexington, where an outfit of raiders take refuge in the buildings and fire down on the ghouls. The only other area that is under Jared's control is a recent acquisition. When the Minutemen retreated from Quincy after being kicked out by the gunners, the survivors went north and passed by the Corvega assembly plant. A subordinate of Jared, named Gristle, saw them and under Jared's direction pursued them into Concord, where they hold up in the Museum of Freedom. Jared's group is the second biggest in the Commonwealth, with around 20 at the plant, 5 in Lexington, and 10 in Concord, so he has the ability to cover more ground if he really wanted to. But instead of completely clearing Lexington of ghouls, he seems more focused on drowning his raiders in chems in pursuit of the gift. So let's take a look at the map. Lexington is filled with ghouls and sometimes a super mutant behemoth, Bahamoth, so the control of his own home turf is not absolute. We don't know of any settlement or group that he actively raids, but it might make sense that nearby settlements are the most targeted. Bunker Hill actually pays Jared in chems to stay away from the caravans, so this probably means that he controls the east-west travel between the two rivers and is therefore in a position to threaten trade caravans. They don't control the area between Lexington and Concord though, since their presence in Concord is new and just a special raiding party to attack the Minutemen and take Mama Murphy for themselves. Oh, and Preston's hat. I guess Gristle really likes it. Who can blame him? The first realistic scenario shows Jared controlling the choke point between the rivers, although Tower Tom and his raiders are just south in the Beantown Brewery, 
so I don't think Jared could extend too far south. Another scenario has Jared exerting control over Grey Garden, as it is a likely raiding spot, although there is no lore to back that up. Although Jared's first obsession is gaining the sight like many big raiders, like many big raiders, he keeps tabs on a few raider bosses. He is primarily interested in Slag, Bosco, and Tower Tom, which are all very reasonable groups since they represent the closest groups that are of any sufficient size. Jared's reaction on news of these raiders' deaths is a bit anxious, actually, remarking that he should post extra guards, or even being worried about what new strong group could have possibly taken out Bosco or Slag. It is obvious that Jared is not as confident as some of the other raider bosses we have looked at so far. The plant is associated with quests, raider troubles, stop the raiding, to the mattresses, and the first step. The last quest is one of the first of the Minutemen quests, where a settlement nearby Sanctuary Hills tells the sole survivor that Jared's raiders are threatening and squeezing them and their resources. These are no surprise, as terminals even state how readily Jared's group will raid caravans, although it is interesting that they do not seem to be interested in kidnapping, since none of the kidnapping quests are associated with the plant. While Jared has a large group, there are a number of things that indicate that he and his group will not likely survive in its current state. His fixation on discovering the gift shifts his focus away from logistics and things that are actually important. Some members will call him out on it, telling him that he is forgoing important things like defense in his single-minded goal. While he might be able to keep new bodies coming into the group with the promise of chems, the fact that they still have not secured Lexington and so readily send off a war party to chase a homeless old lady are not the hallmarks of a leader that can make sound decisions. His terminal entries reflect his insecurities as well, and I don't think it would even take an outside group to make Jared and his group fall apart. If he continues to lead like he is, it will likely happen as a consequence of his own bad decisions. Tower Tom is the last of the big conventional raider groups that we will look at. All the raider groups after this have a lot less information and therefore less to investigate on the map and speculate on. Tower Tom has around 10 raiders at his base at Beantown Brewery, which is a lot less than everyone else we have spoken of, but he sent a fairly large contingent to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Laser Regional Office, which I'm just going to call the Batful from now on, because apparently they are having supply issues. This location has another group of 10, so with around 20 raiders under his command, he is smaller, but this was actually kind of a recent development. Tower Tom decided to take Beantown Brewery because he and his crew liked the idea of basically endless alcohol. That is great and all, but then they realized they had to eat too, and had difficulty getting food supplies. This is causing Tower Tom to lose members as they desert due to low supplies, and is forcing Tom's hand to look for more supplies. Northwest of the brewery is a facility that functioned as a pre-war ration site, and as such has a very large amount of pre-war food and supplies, and Tom sets his sights on this location. The only problem is, it is run by another raider group, and although they are a little bit smaller, this group, run by Red Tourette, is dug in really well. Tom raided the location, and took heavy casualties as a result retreating in what seemed like a disastrous loss. It would have been, had a few of his raiders not taken Red's sister Lily captive. This stroke of luck meant that Tom started to extort Red for supplies, having her sister write letters begging Red to give in to Tom's demands. This solved Tom's problems for a while, that is until he accidentally killed Lily, which is just such a raider thing to have happen. Oops, I killed the golden goose. He tried to forge Lily's letters to keep the flow of supplies, but Red became suspicious, and Tom was forced to find an alternate source of supplies. Interestingly, there is no recorded attempts by his crew to raid local settlements, even though Grey Garden and Oberlin Station settlements are much closer than the federal rationing site. So let's take a look at the map and see what Tom's area of influence may be. His location is actually a fairly strong defensive position, as he is close to and likely controls the few bridges that cross the river. Out east, he is likely limited from expansion due to the presence of hordes of ghouls at College Square, as well as Dance's outfit at the Cambridge Police Station, and super mutants just south. However, the only thing keeping Tom in check up north would be Jared and his crew, so it is possible they control some northern territory. South of the brewery, though, 
they have very little opposition, and it seems very natural that they could easily control this area, as many of the concentrated groups of creatures and super mutants are on the other side of the river. A realistic scenario might include Grey Garden to the north and some territory just across the river, but it would be hemmed in on both sides by large groups of hostiles. Extending south of the river, it is really hard to say how far their influence could go, and Oberlin Station is just so close, it is hard to believe that they don't go there and demand a few Tatoes every once in a while. I drew the border at a rather arbitrary point, but it wouldn't extend down past Vault 81 since that vault is well known and open to trading, and if Tom could, he would likely try to exploit that. Here is another realistic option, with farther control south, pulling up short of Vault 81, and maybe some control in the northwest since they were able to successfully travel to the federal rationing site and attack Red's group. I don't think it's possible for Tom to control the entire area to the bad to full office, where some of his raiders are scavenging for supplies, since Jared's large group is so close, and this part of Boston starts to get more densely populated with hostile groups. You can definitely sneak from the brewery to the bad to full office, although you have to take the long way around. Here is the liberal scenario, since there is technically a way to sneak to a reader group in Cambridge, and also includes Grey Garden and more area towards Red Tourette. But I think this is really stretching it. Tom has some terminal entries to mention a few raider leaders, should they die before the sole survivor arrives at the brewery. Tom is most interested in the news that Bosco, Jared, and Red Tourette have died, which all makes sense to me. Bosco would be the biggest group south of him, and really well known in the whole commonwealth due to his gang's size and holdings. Also it would make sense Tom would keep an eye on Jared since they are so close and their territories would definitely bump up against each other, perhaps causing problems if they were to disagree on who owns that turf. Lastly, he is the only one interested in Red's death for reasons that I hope are obvious. Upon hearing that she has died, he immediately sends out scouts to make sure that no one is settling down at the stockpile, and to make sure there is still a good amount of supplies that they can take. It is super interesting to note that the only quest associated with the brewery is to the mattresses. No radiant kidnappings or raiding quests are associated with Tom. In contrast, the bad to full office has raider troubles, stop the raiding, kidnapping, and to the mattresses which to me means that Tom's subordinate, Sparta, who is running the show at the office, is operating a lot differently than Tom. The lack of raiding and kidnapping based raiding quests at the brewery might indicate that Tom is not raiding the nearby settlements and prefers to get necessary supplies just given to him as opposed to going out and killing for it, like an honest to Adam raider. Tom is a baffling leader. He tried to raid a well fortified opponent to get supplies and was rebuffed. Getting lucky when Red's sister was captured. He sent a large group, one larger than can be found at the brewery, quite far and across many hostile groups to find supplies, while not referencing any of the really close settlements like Oberlin Station or Grey Garden. He set up at the brewery primarily for the alcohol, rather than any logistical reasons, and recorded in terminals that he wants to take on Jared or even Bosco, who are much bigger and more powerful than himself. He also has the chance to strike a deal with Bunker Hill, as Kessler is aware of his push east by taking the bad to full office. But Tom's raiders just chase the messengers off, meaning that a potential way to get extra supplies is being completely spurned. Given all this, I would expect Tom to continue to struggle with supplying his crew. There is no consistent plan. Tom apparently does not care to raid or kidnap, and when opportunities basically fall into his lap, like taking Lily hostage or Bunker Hill wanting to strike a deal, he screws it up. I could see Tom losing power as a main boss, and Sparta at the bad to full office becoming more influential if they can get at the supplies at the office. They are doing more raiding and kidnapping than Tower Tom, apparently. They're located closer to Bunker Hill and would therefore be able to levy dues on passing caravans. If I were a betting man, which I'm not since Adam frowns upon such practices, I would expect Tower Tom to fade into obscurity as a result of his ineptitude and his underling, Sparta, to start her own group. However, if Red Tourette is killed and Tom is able to successfully occupy the stockpile, then there's a chance Tom could continue to be a force in the wasteland. Those are all the big players in the commonwealth, but there are several smaller raider groups sprinkled around the wasteland that are worth looking at, even if there's less to talk about. Let's look at Cinder's group, located at the Revere Beach Station first. 
There really is very little to discuss about this group, as there is no information pertaining to what their history or goals are. The location is involved with the quests Raider Troubles, Kidnapping, Stop the Raiding, and To the Mattresses, so it appears they are fully involved in every Raider's favorite sports. Which would make sense, since they wouldn't be able to bully Bunker Hill the same way larger Raider groups do. This group does have a lot of Raiders though, just over 20, in and outside of the station. Which could make sense, otherwise they would likely be wiped out or assimilated by the three large groups around them. The Forged, Libertalia, and Zeller. Given that they are kind of squished between these larger groups, I can't imagine that they would have too much territory, and something like this is a realistic option in my opinion. The question is whether they will be able to stay independent of the other three, and even though they do have quite a few raiders, the other three have just as many or more men and more resources by dominating other areas or extracting resources from other groups. If Cinder's group has any chance of surviving, they need to be able to do the same and I just don't know if they can. Moving west, we arrive at Malden Center, another station that is held by a raider group led by Helter Skelter. This is a unique location because when the Soul Survivor happens upon the station, the raider group is in the middle of dying from an Institute attack. Many Gen 1 and 2 synths are working their way deeper into the station, having already killed all the raiders on the first floor. The Soul Survivor must then fight both the Synths and the Raiders, with their Raider boss at the very end of the station. If the Soul Survivor is allied with the Institute, then all the Raiders will be dead except for the Raider boss that is holed up at the end of the station, but it is unclear what the Institute's purpose is for this station. The location is not associated with any Raider or kidnapping quests, but is associated with some Synth-related Radiant quests. This stands in contrast to some terminal entries that talk about how some caravan raids have brought in much needed supplies, and Helter even comments that life down in the station is much better than getting burned by slag and the forged. However, it seems that they are destined for death at the hands of the Institute, so it makes sense that the location would not be considered a raider location, and therefore not eligible for raider radiant quests. They are also packed in with super mutants on the west and south, and gunners to the east, so I don't know what areas they could realistically occupy without causing massive problems with stronger enemies. Up north and west we see Boomer and his band of raiders that have occupied outpost Zamonja. This area was a settlement before it was attacked and occupied by Boomer and his goons. The quests associated with this location are Raider Troubles, Clearing the Way, and Taking Point. The last two are Minutemen specific quests where the outpost is considered a useful area to clear to allow settlers a safe place to live. Boomer has defensive positions down the ravine from the outpost and likely raids Ten Pines Bluff which is the closest settlement to them. Otherwise, they will need to travel a ways to get to any other settlement to raid, but the Skylanes Crash just south of them has the chance to spawn raiders which could very well be Boomer's group just based on proximity. As a result, I think this is a decent guess as to the areas that they may control, because even though they are a smallish group, they also don't have any other groups close to restrict their territorial ambitions, except for Ak Ak out west. The group has too little information to speculate much on, but it seems Boomer has made a reputation for himself since the idle chat by raiders in the commonwealth will sometimes mention Boomer's death and their approval of his crew getting wiped out. Akak and her group have holed up at the US Air Force Satellite Station Olivia, with the express purpose to loot the station, which makes it seem like they are not intending on staying there. Regardless, the group is well known for having attacked Abernathy Farm southwest of their position, where they killed the Abernathy's daughter, Mary, and took a locket that was a family heirloom. The Abernathy's will ask the sole survivor to confront the raiders and get the locket back. I find it interesting that they traveled as far as they did to attack the farm rather than attacking Ten Pines Bluff just east of their position. Additionally, there is a small raider camp to the west and a disguised raider known as Sully just south at a quarry who is trying to drain all the water. It is possible that either could be associated with Akak, -Ak, although the fact that Sully will become a raider boss if the quarry is drained makes me think that Sully is acting for himself, not associated with Akak. -Ak. Here is a reasonable estimate of their influence that includes that small raider camp and Sully, but nothing would indicate that their influence goes as far west as Abernathy Farm. Another reasonable estimate would include Sully and the quarry, and encompass Ten Pines Bluff since it seems only logical that the closest settlement to them would potentially be under their control. 
They are involved in quests, stop the raiding, raider troubles, and to the mattresses. The raiding ones make sense, but it looks like they don't care to take prisoners, which may be hinted by their willingness to kill Mary and take her locket, as opposed to taking her and the locket. Lastly, it seems like this group is associated with the LNL gang. Since the raiders are only there to loot the station, I speculate that they will move on after some time, especially since this area of the map has a rather low density of settlements and other sites of interest. Although I spoke of Sully in the context of Ak Ak's group, there is a distinct possibility that he is trying to create his own crew, so he is worth mentioning. After draining the quarry, he successfully establishes a rather large raider group, between 15 and 20 members, which would seem to imply that he had an existing crew, or at least had connections that he could use, since growing to that size so quickly would be difficult. Sully and his raiders will be hostile, even though the sole survivor had helped before, and since the location then becomes associated with Stop the Raiding and Raider Troubles quests, they seem to be actively involved in raiding the surrounding area. The close proximity to Akak -Ak and the fact that he has the most raiders of any group in this area means he could realistically project power a lot further, so I think something like this is reasonable. Soli seems quite entrenched, and with the most raiders of any group in the northwest corner, it is not likely that he will lose control or be wiped out by another group. Walden Pond was famous in the pre-war for being close to a philosopher and influential thinker, Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau's original home and the old tourist building have been taken over by Walter and his small raider crew. His crew doesn't seem the brightest as some are illiterate, being taught about transcendentalism by one of the only literate members, Tweez. Tweez is kind of an idiot though because he has to be reminded by the boss, Walter, to stop using a certain locked door so already this group is off to a terrible start. They are associated with the raider troubles and stop the raiding quests, but no kidnapping ones. They also appear to be associated with the LNL gang, but there is no more information on that. Given this crew's small size and the lack of targets in this area, I don't see this group ever becoming anything bigger, and Red Tourette's gang in the south likely keeps them from extending in that direction very much. We've talked about Red Tourette and her group in relation to Tower Tom, but let's look at what we haven't covered in relation to her and her raider group. Located at the Federal Station stockpile, her group has all the supplies that they would need, and due to that, has been targeted by Tom. Tourette commands a respectable number of people, just shy of 20 in the large complex and fortified positions outside. But it is rather surprising that it isn't larger, considering the large amount of supplies that they have. Because they have a lot of supplies, raiding is probably not as much of a priority, although this location is connected to raider troubles, stop the raiding, kidnapping, and to the mattresses, so they must travel a fair distance to target settlements like Grey Garden or Abernathy Farm. Fort Hagen is to the south and used by the Institute, which would likely not let raiders control the area, and it is obvious that they haven't looted ArcJet systems since it has only recently come into the Institute's control. I think this is a realistic scenario being limited in the south by Fort Hagen, and north by the Walden Pond raiders, and arc jet systems to the east. There is a reasonable chance that a small group of raiders at an unmarked location is part of her group, given their small size and proximity to hers. Red Tourette's relationship with Tom is well established at this point, but it is worth mentioning that she sent a raider to infiltrate Tom's group to see if Lily is still alive, because she could tell that the letters were no longer being written by her sister. If Tom is killed by the player, she will mention that Tom is dead, and her sister is nowhere to be found, but does believe that she's still alive somewhere and is still looking for her. Tourette appears to have come into control of the group after a mutiny removed the old leader, which would make you think that she has some strong support from her crew, but recent events with Tom would suggest otherwise. When Red heard about her sister, she wanted to strike quickly and attack Tom, but her followers thought it was unwise. Red is also desperately doing anything she can to recover her sister, having a raider infiltrate Tom's crew, and subsequently promising to find her no matter where she is. If her crew thinks that she is putting the good of her sister, who, as far as they know, is dead, above themselves, they could mutiny again. They have set a precedent of replacing the leader when they are dissatisfied with them. I think raiders' control of the group will depend on how far she is willing to push things for her sister. Demo and his gang are closer to Boston and use Hardware Town as their base of operations. His crew is smaller at seven or so people, but they have a method of luring victims that seems to be quite effective. One raider dressed as a settler sits outside the hardware store and cries for help. When the sole survivor goes to investigate, 
they are told that the settler's friend is in need of help. When going inside, the sole survivor is then ambushed by Demo and his gang, and a desperate firefight ensues. The raiders have been dumping victims' bodies into the basement, where they have accumulated quite the pile of bodies, proving that the tactic is successful. Demo's group is quite small at around only six or seven raiders inside and out, and given their proximity to Boston, it is probably only a matter of time before bigger fish, like Bosco, come along. The quests involved here are Stop the Raiding, Raider Troubles, Kidnapping, To the Mattresses, and Diamond City's Most Wanted. It seems that Demo has made a reputation for himself at Diamond City, but this may be partly due to his close proximity to the settlement, similar to how Clutch, just north of Diamond City, is wanted as well. Demo appears to be making the most of his small crew, although it wouldn't be feasible for Demo to cover much territory, so I think it is reasonable to assume that they really only have control just outside of Hardware Town. In addition to being pretty close to Bosco, a strong and very aggressive raider boss, Demo appears to have some problems with his small crew. You can hear one of his raiders question Demo's competence, and shortly after, the raider is killed, but not by Demo, by another raider. So as far as what Demo's future may hold, I contend that it isn't looking great, considering his small crew size, raiders questioning his competence as leader, and being close to stronger raider groups. Scudder controls a group of raiders at Hyde Park, a flooded residential area where you either swim or get around on the roofs and catwalks between buildings. The Fallout 4 game guide gives a disturbing detail of this group, that they apparently remove and wear the skin of their victims. Yikes, that's just unsanitary. They are not even all that large of a group, at around 10 raiders, but according to the quest list are very active raiders, but apparently not kidnappers. I wonder if this is because they flay the skin off of anyone that they would have otherwise kidnapped. Looking at the map, settlements are quite far from Hyde Park, and they are not far from super mutants, gunners, and other raiders. This along with their size would limit the amount of territory they could claim, and with not much else to go off of, something like this seems reasonable. Of course, any group can always mount a raiding party and strike far outside of their area of control, but this is always risky, especially if there are a lot of enemy groups or creatures close by. When speculating about Scudder and his group, an important detail to know is that the gunners located nearby have infiltrated his group. One or more raiders at Hyde Park are secret gunners, gathering intel for maybe a prospective attack by the gunners. Bosco also seems to have a beef with Scudder for some reason, and that is a powerful person to have as an enemy, even if they are a fair distance away. Given these circumstances and the fact that they are a small group with only a few settlements to go after, I do not see Scudder's group surviving very far into the future. A unique raider group has holed up in the toxic and radioactive Quincy Quarries led by a boss named Slough. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced, although I used to say slough or slough before I looked up the word which means a swamp, and it's apparently pronounced as slough. Slough and his fellow raiders are all ghouls, some of the few that can live in an area covered in radiation. The only quest of consideration for this location is to the mattresses. No raiding or kidnappings for these guys apparently. The only other interesting information about this group is that they uncovered Vault 81 and can be found trying to find a way in. They have around 15 raiders, so while they're bigger than Scudder's group directly to the north, they're still relatively medium sized. It is hard to really say what their area of influence may be, but they would definitely be stopped from going south due to super mutants and gunners, and Scudder's group is to the north. The fact that they don't have any raidings or kidnapping quests almost makes it seem like they get their money and supplies in other ways. Maybe it is tied to the quarry itself, and they are able to somehow profit off of the machinery or even the limestone itself in the quarry, but we just don't know. Slough has a better chance of surviving than Scudder, since there will be fewer people interested in the irradiated location, but if they are perceived by the nearby gunners to be too much of a threat, the gunners can make a move against them. South and east of the Quincy Quarries lies a Poseidon energy plant, which has raiders all around the roof and catwalks under the leadership of a boss named Cuddy. Unless the sole survivor can hack a master terminal, they will be forced to sneak in through some exterior pipes, and it is obvious that Cuddy does not have full control of the station. The entire lower portion is infested with Mirelurks, which the raiders keep isolated to the basement by locking doors and turning on the station's security system. Leading about 12 raiders, the Mirelurks are not the only issue that the gang will face. Synths will be found invading the power plant and can even be found led by a courser 
They will be in the process of eliminating the whole crew. However, this is only if the Institute is friendly to the sole survivor and their quest line has advanced enough. The quests associated with this location confirm this link with the Institute, as the quests Rogue Courser and Variable Removal both involve eliminating a Courser synth at the location. What the Institute's interest in the location is, is not known, but likely has something to do with the energy technology since the Institute has prioritized energy independence for their future plans. Cuddy's group is not even in full control of the facility, and this may indicate that they cannot project power. I'm keeping the area of influence just around the power plant, since they are not associated with any raiding quests, and their fates seem sealed, since the Institute sends an attack group led by a courser to their location, and those coursers aren't great at making friends. The most easterly raider group stands out because they are the only non-English speaking raiders in the Commonwealth. The FMS North Star was a transport ship with a Norwegian crew that ran aground after the events of the Great War. The crew ghoulified and made the ship their eternal home, having stayed there for centuries. Their leader is named Rags, which is not a Scandinavian name I am familiar with, and he commands about 10 raiders. They seem to be struggling with containing the Mirelurks that have infested the broken hull of the ship, which is a bit surprising because they've been on the ship for a long time. You would think that they would have come up with a more robust solution for any curious Mirelurks. The only quests they are associated with are to the mattresses, meaning that they do, in fact, have some associations outside of their Norwegian crew. That also means there are no raiding or kidnapping missions associated with them. This is peculiar, since they are so close to the Warwick homestead and could very easily raid the settlement as needed. They wouldn't have much resistance south and west of their position, so I marked that as a possible area that they could easily control. So with so little to go off of, it is difficult again to speculate, but I think that the group may continue to exist as long as they can keep the Mirelurk problem contained. Since they are all Norwegian ghouls, they seem unable or unwilling to take on new recruits, so if they were to lose members every once in a while to a Mirelurk attack, their numbers would dwindle to the point that they would be unable to defend themselves any longer. That covers all the raider groups that I'm analyzing in this video but I know that it does not go over every single named raider and didn't even include the Triggermen. What's with that? Well, the Triggermen occupy an interesting spot, similar to the Gunners, where they certainly behave like raiders, but they also aren't classical raiders. They have group identities, have holdings scattered around the Commonwealth, and seem to be less interested in actual raiding and more interested in either mercenary work or mob-like activities. Sinjin is another raider that is a little different from any other raider boss and deserves to be spoken of in a separate video. So the last thing I want to do is just look generally at the map and see what patterns emerge or if we can notice anything interesting. It comes as no surprise that no raiders are found in the glowing sea area. In fact, the closest raiders aren't even on the edge of the glowing sea. This makes sense as raiders depend on exploiting others to get supplies that they can't get and there just aren't very many people in the glowing sea. That is, except for Adam's holy people at the crater. It makes sense that downtown Boston sees a higher number of named and unnamed raider groups. But even the northeast part of the map has four large raider groups and a bunch of unnamed raider groups. Although this area isn't nearly as densely populated as downtown Boston. So that is rather interesting. Okay, that is it for now, brothers and sisters. I will have to do a comment highlight in my next long form video because this video went on much longer than I had anticipated. If you liked how long this was, then consider it a belated Christmas gift. If you didn't like how long it was, nothing would devastate me more than liking and subscribing. A quick thanks to my wonderful patrons who have ensured a special place in Adam's heavenly crater with their generous contributions. You guys are amazing. Go forth with the power of Adam. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you next week.